We get eyes on SpaceX's potential spy sat fairing, why did these boosters switch from the drone ships, and did NASA almost lose their oldest ongoing mission? I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 4th of August, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. As the company continues to ramp up commercial spaceflight operations, Virgin Galactic reported mixed results in quarter two of 2023. The company generated nearly $2 million in revenue this quarter, which came from the scientific experiments that were on board Spaceship 2's May test and the later commercial mission Galactic 01. These were the company's first revenue-generating missions since 2018. However, Virgin Galactic also posted an adjusted earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization of $116 million and a net loss of $134 million for the quarter. Most of this was $141 million of operating expenses, which was up year over year. Additionally, the company expects to incur higher operating expenses in the second half of 2023 as it begins preparing for commercial service. Thankfully, Virgin ended the quarter with a cash position of $980 million, which will be used for further development and marketing of its space tourism services. Given this loss, do you think we'll see another round of fundraising? The company is currently in preparations for its second commercial flight, Galactic 02, which will launch six people into space on August 10th. It's expected that after this flight, Virgin Galactic will resume selling tickets, which will likely be more expensive than the current $250,000 per seat price point. Now, according to Virgin Galactic, they currently have 600 reservations and over a thousand expressions of interest through their One Small Step program, which allows potential customers to pay a refundable deposit of $1,000 to secure a spot. So let us know. Do you want to fly on Spaceship 2? This week, ESA's Euclid telescope sent back its first test images from its visible and near-infrared instruments. These photos of galaxies, stars, and asteroids from the visible instrument covers an area of 0.5 square degrees, roughly the size of two full moons in the sky. This image contains 100,000 galaxies, some of which are as far as 10 billion light years away. The image has a resolution of 0.1 arc seconds, allowing it to image galaxies of many different shapes, such as spiral, elliptical, and irregular. These images also show some galaxy clusters, distorted and magnified by the dark matter between them and us due to gravity. Also visible are stars of the Milky Way, some so bright that the mirrors in the telescope cause the star-shaped pattern. Much of this is also visible in the first near-infrared instrument, which covers an area of 0.16 square degrees, roughly half a full moon. This contains about 10,000 galaxies, some of which are even further away than the visible photos due to the redshifting of the light. This instrument has a resolution of 0.3 arc seconds, allowing for objects to be distinguished that are separated by less than three thousandths of a degree in the sky. It is worth noting that these are just the raw images, meaning they haven't been processed or calibrated for scientific use. Some of the artifacts, such as bright spots, streaks, and rings that are caused by reflections, cosmic rays, and detector noise will be removed or corrected in the final images. These are the first images in Euclid's overarching goal to unravel the universe's biggest mysteries, dark matter and dark energy. Over the coming six years, the telescope will take similar images of one third of the night sky. And in doing so, it will measure the shapes and the distances of billions of galaxies and quasars, probing at what caused the expansion of the universe and the formation of the cosmic structure. This will be done by measuring the redshift of galaxies out to a value of 2, which is the equivalent to seeing roughly 10 billion years back in time. Now let's take a look at This Week in Launches. ISRO's Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle lifted off on July 30th at 101 UTC from the first launch pad in the Satish Dhawan Space Center in India. The rocket carried the DSR satellite to low Earth orbit for Singapore alongside six rideshare payloads. SAR stands for Synthetic Aperture Radar, a way of increasing spatial resolution through the motion of imaging radars. The satellite launch will provide the Singaporean government with observation of Earth and how it changes over time. On Wednesday, August 2nd, at 31 minutes past midnight UTC, Northrop Grumman successfully launched the final Antares 230 Plus on the CRS NG-19 mission. The rocket lifted off from Launchpad 0A at the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, sending the Cygnus spacecraft to the ISS. 
Following orbit raising burns, the spacecraft birthed with the ISS on August 4th at 9.55 UTC. With the final 200 series Antares launch, Northrop has their sights set on the 300 series, a collaboration with Firefly Aerospace. So when do you think this will launch? Let us know in the comments! A Changzheng 4C rocket lifted off from the South Launch Site 2 at the Jiquan Satellite Launch Center in China on August 3rd at 3.47 UTC. The rocket placed the 2,250kg Polar Orbiting Weather Satellite into sun-synchronous orbit. Once in its operational orbit, FY3F will replace the aging FY3C satellite, and it's expected the satellite will be dedicated to atmospheric probing, weather forecasting, and climate change monitoring. With this launch, China has placed 20 FY satellites of two generations in orbit, of which eight are still operational. On August 3rd at 5 o'clock UTC, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket successfully lifted the Galaxy 37 satellite into geostationary transfer orbit. The booster, B-1077, flying for its sixth time, successfully landed on Just Read the Instructions, marking SpaceX's 213th booster landing. The satellite was dropped off into a Geo-1630, meaning the satellite will only need 1,630 meters per second of delta V to reach its 127 degree west slot in geostationary Earth orbit, aka Geo. This mission marked Falcon 9's 243rd launch overall and 176th Falcon 9 flight with a flight-proven booster. It's impressive that now only roughly a quarter of all Falcon 9 launches were with a new booster. But perhaps the most exciting launch happened right at the beginning of the week. SpaceX launched their third Falcon Heavy of the year. Launching off from historic Launch Complex 39A on July 29th at 3.04 UTC, this launch was special in a few ways. First of all, massing 9,200 kilograms, the Echo Star 24 payload was the heaviest geostationary satellite ever launched. Pretty heavy news, huh? The vehicle consisted of side boosters B-1064 and B-1065 flying for a third time, and the center core B-1074 on its maiden flight. Both side boosters successfully landed on landing zones 1 and 2, and the center core was expended. Now, originally both side boosters were scheduled to land on two drone ships downrange. However, shortly before launch, this was changed to dual RTLS with a new re-entry profile, a one-engine entry burn and a 131 engine landing burn. This is when the center engine ignites, followed by the two outer engines to slam on the brakes, and then final approach to the landing pad on a single engine. This flight also marked the first flight of the medium coast kit for the second stage. This kit is installed on the second stage to increase the number of second stage engine ignitions, as well as adding the gray stripe to help keep RP-1 in its liquid state throughout the orbital night. This allowed for a third burn of the second stage about three and a half hours after liftoff that raised its perigee and decreased the inclination. These changes allowed the Falcon Heavy to place Echo Star 24 into an 8001 by 35,504 kilometer orbit inclined 10.39 degrees. This corresponds to Geo 1000, which is way more energy than your normal geostationary transfer orbit that you see on a Falcon 9. A remarkable feat given the payload's mass and RTLS of both boosters. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week, SpaceX and NASA teams tested SpaceX's long fairing at the Neil Armstrong test facility. This was shielding effectiveness testing, ensuring that payloads inside the fairing are safe from outside radio frequency sources. Now this was our first look at the extended fairing. Sadly, the photos do not give a good idea for how large the fairings are. However, based on documentation in Falcon Heavy's payload user's guide, these fairings should be almost exactly the same diameter as the normal fairings with over 5 meters of additional height, totaling just over 18 meters tall. Unlike SpaceX's standard fairing, teams will not attempt to recover these fairings. Because of this, the extended fairing is kept together by a frangible seam joint. This detonation-based deployment is simpler than the reusable latches used to hold the standard fairing together. It's pretty awesome that we're finally seeing extended fairing Falcon Heavy hardware. This week, Orion Space completed two booster separation tests for Gravitation 1. Orion Space is a Chinese private company founded in 2020. The company is developing a medium-class launch vehicle capable of delivering three tons of payload into low Earth orbit. The vehicle's first stage consists of the center core with strap-on solid boosters, which produced 150 tons of thrust at liftoff. The center core is a single solid rocket, 2.65 meters in diameter, that produces 255 tons of thrust, the most powerful solid rocket China has ever tested. 
Orion Space aims to launch in the fourth quarter of this year. L3 Harris Technologies has announced an agreement to acquire Aerojet Rocketdyne for $4.7 billion in an all-cash transaction. This comes out to $58 per share. This deal comes two years after Lockheed Martin sought to buy Aerojet in a $4.4 billion bid, which was blocked by antitrust regulators earlier this year. This week, United Launch Alliance announced that it's shipping a VIP, a very important package, to Florida. On board ULA's rocket ship is the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage 3, which will support the Artemis 3 mission. This stage was built in ULA's Decatur Rocket Factory, where it is now being shipped to the Cape. Once it arrives, ULA, Boeing, and NASA teams will complete final checkouts and inspections before being stored for use on Artemis 3. It's wild we're seeing hardware that will take a yet-to-be-announced crew back to the moon. This week, NASA lost communication with Voyager 2 as its antenna pointed two degrees away from Earth. NASA teams expect the spacecraft to remain on its trajectory and to reset its orientation in October, which will allow for communications to resume. Thankfully, on August 1st, NASA picked up the carrier signal from Voyager 2 during its regular scan of the sky. This is the spacecraft's heartbeat, which confirms that the spacecraft is still broadcasting. Voyager 2 is a staggering 19.9 billion kilometers from Earth and traveling at a speed of over 15 kilometers per second. So even though two degrees might not sound like a lot, using trigonometry, we can calculate this angle to cause a nearly 700 million kilometer offset. That's nearly the radius of Jupiter's orbit. And now let's go over next week in spaceflight. Rocket Lab has further pushed back Electron's 40th launch due to winds at Launch Complex 1. Liftoff is set for next week from New Zealand with the We Love the Nightlife mission. The two-hour launch window opens on August 6th at 5 o'clock UTC. SpaceX is aiming to launch another 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites to low Earth orbit on its Starlink Group 68 mission. Liftoff is currently scheduled for two minutes past midnight UTC. Following launch, the first stage will land on a shortfall of Gravitas. Roscosmos is set to launch the GLONASS K2 No. 13L satellite on August 7th at 14.10 UTC. Launching from the Playsets Cosmodrome in Russia, this Soyuz 2.1b will place the GLONASS navigation system into a medium Earth orbit. SpaceX is set to launch its Starlink Group 620 mission on August 8th in the early morning UTC. This mission will lift off from Space Launch Complex 4 East in Vandenberg. China is set to launch a Changzheng 2C from LC9 at the Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center in China. Launch is scheduled for 2255 UTC on August 8th. Virgin Galactic will launch its second commercial mission on Thursday, August 10th at 1400 UTC. VMS Eve will take off from Spaceport America and be dropped from White Knight 2. Roscosmos is set to launch the Luna 25 Lunar Lander to Translunar Injection from Site 1S at the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. This will be the first Russian-Soviet lunar probe since 1976. Liftoff is scheduled for 2320 UTC on August 10th. And ending next week's busy launch schedule will be SpaceX's Starlink Group 6-9 mission, which, if schedule holds, will set a new pad turnaround time for Slick 40. Liftoff is set for August 10th at 2323 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.